So glad that y'all have committed to be here tonight and to be able to, for us to be able to worship God together and also to, to be committed to His Word and to the Bible class that we're going to have here in just a moment. Uh, I'd like for us to look at uh, Hebrews chapter 10, if you'll turn there. It was from the third point from the lesson last week where I, I mentioned that practice shows commitment to fellowship. You have shown that commitment tonight in coming back to worship God. You know, in Hebrews 10 and verse 37 through 39, we have a picture of what commitment looks like. It says, For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. You know, we like it when people are committed, don't we? You know, when, when you look at someone who is not willing to shrink back, who's willing to stand up so that they're preserving their soul and preserving the fellowship, we like it when though we see those who are committed. But it depends on what it is that they're committed to, right? I mean, when it comes to being committed, it's for the truly faithful. I'm going to just read it. Being committed is for the truly faithful, but it is also for the truly insane. Being committed is for the truly faithful, but it's also for the truly insane. And that's what the world's going to see when you are truly faithful to the Lord. That there's really no difference between being faithful to God and being committed into an insane asylum. Because people will not see the difference when it comes to the world. Where do I get that? Why, why is that something that is, can be one and the same in the world? Well, faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. The world looks at that and thinks, that's insane. Faith has substance and it has something that you hope for and it's the evidence of things that are not seen. That happens to be the very next verse to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 39. When we read verse 39, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. For by it the people of old receive their, the, their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. When I look around and I see the creation. Uh, Mary and I before the sun went down very rapidly. We were, we were commenting on, on Chalkville Mountain Road. You look and see the beautiful changing of the colors of the, of the maples and, and the oak trees. And looking at the gorgeous nature that we see. We understand that those things that are visible were not created by hands of human devising. They were created by God. You know, we can take wood and we can... Uh, we can take that tree, we can create wood from that tree and, and, and fashion a pulpit very similar to the one that, that is here. And it took a designer to do so. And that gives us evidence that, that this is here for, for a purpose of, of pro proclaiming the word of God. But somebody had to build it. But there's no one that could create these, uh, these lines. There's no one that could actually cause this tree to grow to form it from, from a seed. No man has ever been able to create it. And so that's how we have evidence that there is a designer. There is a creator through the things that God, so that, that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. But do we have examples of those who were convicted, who didn't shrink back, but were committed? Well, it just so happens, verse 4, by faith. Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. Verse 5, by faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Verse 7, by faith, Noah, being warned by God 
concerning events as yet unseen in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he con condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Verse 6, I skipped it. It says, and without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Are you committed tonight? Are you drawing near to him? Because through faith, you can please God. Your, co your commitment causes God to be pleased. We understand that those who shrink back are destroyed. Those who shrink back, God has no pleasure in them. Chapter 10 and verse 38. But the opposite is true. If you draw near to him, you'll find pleasure in the eyes of God. If you have faith like these men and women, verse 11, by faith Sarah herself received <coughs> excuse me, power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered himself faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. They recognized that they were strangers and exiles on earth. If you're truly committed to God, people will see the difference that your treasure is in heaven, not on this earth your commitment will cause people to wonder why. Why is that person so commit, committed? That person never draws back from, from their faith. They never draw back from God. What is, what is going on with that person? Why are they smiling in the midst of, of struggle, in the, the midst of turmoil? Because we are called to something greater than this earth, this world can offer. This world might even go so far as to say that your commitment to God is an insane thing. But in the midst of struggle, when, when, when you've got a smile on your face because you're, you, you recognize what God is offering you, an eternal reward. People are wanting, they want that in the midst of theirs. They want that in the midst of their struggle, in the midst of their, their pain. They want to know how to smile and they're going to look to you for those answers, if you're willing to stand firm, if you're willing to press on and not shrink back. We could keep reading and look at all of these wonderful examples of those who did not shrink back, who, who had these faith, this faith. We're, we're it's summed up in chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also... Lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You know, when it's, you're seeking to be committed to the Lord. There's going to be weights. Notice this says weight and sin. There's going to be things that, that are weighing heavy on you. Things that you've got to, to, to finish, you have to do. But then also there's going to be sin that's in your life. And when it comes to weight, sin is very close at hand. The weight that, that we have when we take it upon ourselves and we're committed elsewhere, that can easily become sin that will then become something that clings so closely. He's saying lay it aside. Don't be committed to those things. Can be committed to the Lord. Lay those weights aside and so that you can run with endurance the race set before you. Verse 2, how do you do that? How do you lay that weight aside? How do you lay the sin aside? Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We have an author who was in every way tempted as we are, yet he did not sin. He had the weight of the world on his shoulders, and he was able to take it. 
He was able to take it at the cross and so that you can give your struggles over to Him. Tonight we have an invitation. We're inviting you to to come and to to strive to, to be committed. Maybe the commitment that you have striven to do on your own with God, you've struggled. And you need the prayers of this congregation. You need the encouragement of those who are running the race with you. Don't run it alone. You also have a cloud of witnesses here at Deerfoot. You have a cloud of witnesses here from chapter 11, yes, but there are others who are running in faith. Do you know of someone that you will look up to? Maybe this invitation coming forward is something that that's just not where you are. But maybe you know of someone that you look up to. Can you reach out to them? Don't go any longer. Go to them and and say, can we talk? I need some prayers. I need some encouragement. Reach out to this great cloud of witnesses in whatever way that you can. But maybe you haven't even started running yet tonight. The only way to lay aside the weight and the sin that's in your life is through Christ. By repenting of your sins and being baptized in a death like His. A burial So that you can rise like him out of that watery grave to walk in newness of life tonight. Do you need to make that commitment to the Lord so that your sins can be removed? Tonight, this invitation is for you. Don't wait any longer. Won't you come while together we stand and sing the invitation?